Hello, everybody. Welcome to Raising Multilinguals Live. My name is Tetsu Young from Ask Tetsu. Welcome. My name is Rita Rosenbach from multilingualparenting.com. Hello, and my name is Ute Limacher Ribold from Ute's International Lounge. And we are very honored and pleased to have Nair Ibrahim today as our guest. She is Associate Professor of English Subject Pedagogy at Nord University in Norway and is going to share her insights into today's topic, which is negotiating identity in multilingual contexts, person, place and experience. So we're going to talk uh, more or focusing more on the school age children this time, right? So who are thinking about who or uh, who they are. Um, and are more aware maybe about their linguistic and multilingual identities. Now, Nair, as I understand, um, the term tripartite framework of identity is central to today's topic. Can you maybe explain what this means? Yes. Um, so, firstly, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a real pleasure being here, um, talking about my favourite topic. Um, so, we're talking about the tripartite framework of identity, um, where children are actually linking and connecting um, their identity to the people in their entourage or the people they speak certain languages with, the places <clears throat> where they actually speak these languages or where they've learned these languages or where they experience these languages and then experiences in these languages. And it's really interesting when you talk to children about this, um, their, their, their connection with their languages and about this identity that they have in their languages, they actually go and look for these experiences and these examples of um, connecting with their languages. <clears throat> so um, I think it's before before I actually just go into the person, place um, and experience, I think it's important to note that um, identity is a very complex um, phenomenon. Um, not only is it complex in itself as, um, as, as, as a concept, but then when you add um, languages, um, it becomes even more complex. And I think it's, um, yet, and yet languages and identity are actually inextricably linked because um, when you actually use your language, the way you use your language immediately positions you as a certain individual in that particular context or in a context where you're using those languages or not or where you're switching between languages or not so that's um extremely and so it's an important element to keep in mind that the, the this idea of a language identity or multilingual identity is exactly that it's multi so mm -hmm. it's multiple it's um, complex um, it's um, shifting, it changes, it's dynamic, it, um, um, and especially in today's um, society where people move, well, I think we've moved a lot more before COVID, but I think we're going to start moving <laughs> again, hopefully. But um, people move, and you don't only need to move physically, you can also move um, technologically and virtually, because technology does give us the opportunity to communicate um, um, in different languages and across borders. So um, that, um, that identity that these um, children are um, negotiating because that's actually what they do the identity that they are developing because as we're talking about children they are still developing the sense of self who they think they are and they're doing it in a situation or in a complex linguistic situation and this complex linguistic situation brings in other elements it brings in cultures um, it brings in ways of being it brings in um, ways of um, thinking um, it brings in concepts that perhaps certain um, languages don't um, 
actually possess. So, um, and children have got to sort of navigate this um, complexity um, as they grow up, as they as 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 they move between, for example, a home where they may speak one particular language, and then a school situation where they are expected to learn or speak a different language. Um, and then sometimes they also have to move from a home to a school or perhaps to a country of origin because maybe their parents come from a different country, a country of origin of the parents where a different language is spoken. So they are constantly moving between these spaces that in our minds or in society we have created as separate spaces. And yet when you actually communicate um, they're not separate spaces. The children are literally moving between and in and out of this, or shuttling. You would shuttling is a word that's been used, and um, shuttling between languages and shuttling between spaces all the time. Um, and children have to make sense of all this as they're growing up. So um, that's where it's really um, fascinating when you actually talk about um, identity and you talk about children's language identity and how they make sense of that. So the way that um, and in, in my research when, um, look, when um, eliciting identity from the children and eliciting their identity narratives, what comes out and what um, is foregrounded really is how the children connect these language experiences to the people that they speak with, the places where they um, use the languages and then the experiences they have in their languages. So let's just give you some examples. Um, some of the children that I um, interviewed and, um, and, and worked with, they would have two different parents, so parents from different um, backgrounds, for example, um, a Ukrainian and a, a British and an English um, speaking parent. Um, but just, these just children... A quick, just a quick question, how old were the children? So it, the, the children in this particular study were aged 5 to 17, so it was actually okay. quite a range. Okay. It was actually quite interesting to see that range as well. Um, but this particular um, example is from a, an 11 year old, a 12 year old. And being um, connecting, so he would connect his language identity, first of all, to the multilingual um, space in his home. So that was already a multilingual identity because there were different languages um, being spoken in the home. But then he had um, the language, he was living in France, so there was the French language as well. Now, even though he would actually, in the interview, he would say that, uh, well, I'm not French. So in that case, he was actually focusing and, and, and identifying his background or his history, so his language history, his cultural history, mum from uh, the UK and dad from Ukraine. French doesn't actually exist in that particular context, yet he's living in a French context. Um, so when he, then at the later stage in the interview, when he was explaining um, that he didn't really like it when he was in the metro and he was speaking English to his mum and the so someone, a French speaker, would come up to him and try and speak English with him. And he would say, oh, you know, he's speaking bad English. But I really don't like it when they do that. Why do they want to come and speak English to me? Because I can speak French. So I turn around to them and I tell them, oui, mais je suis français, je parle français. I can speak French. So it's, it's, it's a sort of a contradiction. First of all, he's saying, I'm not French. And then in this particular context, he's trying to be French. He's trying to position himself as, as a French speaker. So that is the complexity of um, multilingualism. And children are constantly learning and being, and, and, you know, of uh, this multilingual identity. They are building this multilingual identity in these contradictory situations. And it sounds contra contradictory when he says, I'm not French, but I want to be seen as a French speaker. But it isn't because multilingual identities are exactly that. They are complex. They are contradictory, um, and then they decenter. I like that. I, I like the idea that idea of decentering, because um, even though you identify as a particular um, uh, from a particular background or as a particular language speaker, you can suddenly, in a different situation, in a different context, position yourself as something completely different. 
Mm -hmm. because that's what you need to do in that particular situation. So identities are not um, this are not fixed. And um, identities and language identities are certainly not fixed. And language identities are not necessarily linked to a particular geog uh, geographical space either. So the child may say, I speak English, French and um, Spanish, um, but English may not be connected, especially English today, because English is spoken all over the world. English may not be connected to what we like to call an English-speaking country, and what are those English-speaking countries? <clears throat> English can be connected to a person or to an experience, so in this case perhaps not to a space. And we had this really wonderful example um, of a 10-year-old, um, he was actually French, um, Spanish and English speaker, and he was trying to explain um, his English identity, even though okay, he had a Spanish mum and a French dad. Um, and he brought in, so I had actually asked children as well to bring in objects, objects that for them represented their language, their languages. And this boy, so he's an English, Spanish, French speaker, brought in a sort of an Arab looking figurine and a camel. And he said, this, these, these are the objects that represent English. And of course, I was a bit confused. I said, hmm, okay, so how does this work? Because you do not associate camels in an Arab figurine with English, do you? You're expecting like fish and chips or yeah. the queen. <laughs> um, and then, but when you actually get the children to um, explain or give you that identity narrative, because identity is about storytelling, isn't it? It's about telling your story. And this um, particular um, boy explained that he learned English in a kindergarten in Dubai. He's never lived in an English speaking country. He was in an inter it was an international school, and when he was age three, parents were living in Dubai, and that's how he picked up English. That's where he learned English. And then he continued learning English in other schools um, in, in France, but in English-speaking schools in France. So um, his connection to English, which he identified and which he claimed as an identity, yes, I am an English speaker, I have an English identity because I speak English and because um, I, I, I have spoken English since I was three. But this connection to English had nothing to do with what we consider to be an English country or an English speaking country. It was connected to his experience of learning English in that particular, uh, in a context that was completely supposed, you know, non-English. So those, um, so the, the, the way children connect and the way children build their multilingual identities does depend on all the different contexts um, that they live in and also the people that they um, use their languages with. And I just want to give one example of people. And that's actually a personal anecdote. It's actually a personal example from, um, with my son. Um, so, I have I have a multilingual background myself, and so does my son. He just had no choice, but he was like thrown into loads of languages. So um, I have Portuguese background, born in South Africa. And my son was actually born in Portugal, and he um, um, learned to speak um, Portuguese really well. There was the first five years, but I spoke to him in English all the time. He would answer in Portuguese all the time. And I know there will be parents out there who are thinking, oh my gosh, yes, that is actually my situation. What do I do? Well, you know, I didn't, I wasn't quite sure how to make him speak English to me. So as in a Portuguese context, I wanted him to learn English. And I tried loads of different strategies and um, they, they didn't work. He just looked at me. And he knew I could speak Portuguese. So that's what, so our relationship was exactly that. My speaking to him in English and him replying in Portuguese. And we were always having normal conversations, perfectly normal conversations, which people around me must have thought, what is going on there? So we then moved to France and um, I suddenly realized that um, English was still in his life because we spoke English at home. Portuguese wasn't at all because now we were not in a Portuguese context, no grandparents, no family. Um, and um, so I thought, mm, maybe I'll speak Portu 
Portuguese to him a little bit. So he doesn't forget his Portuguese because he developed his Portuguese so well in Portugal, it'd be so sad to let it go. And um, so I remember he was actually playing on the ground. He was five years old, playing with his little cars on the floor in the lounge. And I turned around to him, spoke Portuguese. He looks up at me and he says, why are you speaking to me like that? With you, it's English. So five years of his life, I was panicking about him not speaking English. And yet, unknowingly, I had actually developed an English relationship with him. And to this day, that's, that's, that's what we speak to each other. It's English. So that our, 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 our relationship language, our identity, the mother-son identity language is English, despite the fact that he insisted on replying to me in Portuguese for the first, you know, the first five years of his life. So children actually, I think the one thing we sometimes forget is how children also have a say in the matter. They should also have a say in the matter in how they identify themselves in the language that they want to speak in a particular context or with a particular person. And I think sometimes we forget to give them this agency because we panic that children are not going to develop these languages. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> May I ask a, a very popular question that I get all the time? And and, and I think you're, 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 <clears throat> the an you've come up with the answer, but it's sort of dancing around it specifically. And that is a question that I get a lot is uh, or that I see a lot is where when people speak different languages, a multilingual or polyglot who speaks different languages feels like a different person. Like it's, it's like you have a different personality depending on the language that you speak. Is this something that you would say is correct or, or from what you've been saying is like you sort of want to project that. Is it you want to project that or you feel something internally that allows you to project that? Um, I think no, um, my answer to that is no. No, okay. <laughs> um, I don't think it's about personality. Okay. Um, personality is part of your identity. It's part of that big umbrella term that is your identity. Now, I don't know it, research when when when. when uh, I know even in research, the, the, the whole idea of personality, you know, does actually come in, into um, some of the papers and, and articles that are written. But I think it's more about um, the uh, how the, the, the structure or the identity, if you want, of the language itself mm -hmm. makes you sound different when you actually speak that language. So it's not necessarily so you feel that you've changed because sometimes you know language for example english is a stress time language so it's much more musical so it goes up and down and up and down french is a syllable timed language so it's much more do 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 so you know probably when you speak french you probably sound like you're more uh, more direct and because the language is more direct um english isn't as direct english has a, oh would you mind please you know it's got all those ways of asking like you before you actually get to the end of this question if you said oh, i don't know how many modal verbs to say oh can you please do this and other languages are much more direct so it's 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 also the i the, the 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 structure of the language itself will probably make you sound different because certain you're expected to um, use certain structures in certain languages and don't you then in the other languages you don't. Um, so I think it's I don't I wouldn't say it's your personality that changes, but the your uh, the way you sound um, the um, perhaps. Um, the attitude that may change the culture yeah. or related to that language as well that you yes. you adapt to to do you um, adapt to the culture that we, the language of which you're speaking there's yes. one other thing i wanted to um um you you touched upon it like when the child's uh, language identity uh, is multifaceted and I think that's such an important thing to get across today because many parents seem to be afraid that they're like let's say somebody's passing on their their native language living in in an other country and say I'm so afraid I can't make my child a proper whatever uh, nationality because 
um, because they think they're doing something wrong and, and that's they, they can't because they don't have all the references, they don't have all the programs, all, all the input that they would have in the native country, but that it's okay. Just like we use the term third culture kit for, for children growing up between cultures, um, then I think this is something we need to bring to the front a lot more. Yes, and uh, I, I once called it as uh, similar to the model of third culture kid, it's a third culture language model where you have actually the, the multilingual children feel more at ease in all their languages when they can use them all. So they feel identifying to all of them, to all the facets that these languages allow them to have and to express. So with different intonations, like you said, Nair, and with uh, different words and ways to put things and also the perspectives. If I explain something in, in German, I explain it in a different way than if I do it in Italian or in French, etc. But I explain the same kind of thing just from different points of view. Yeah. Uh, and that gives me, this is actually the advantage of being multilingual or this multi-competence for multilinguals that uh, Li Wei mentioned in his, uh, um, in the interview. I would like to um, just mention that, uh, Heather, thank you, Heather, for your comment. So interesting, that's a great point about not forgetting to listen to what our children want. And I think this is a, a very important point uh, because when we are raising the children, um, we, at the beginning at least, at some point, maybe we might change because we realize that they have uh, much more say than we initially think or uh, assume, um, that they have a say from, quite early on actually because of their reactions to how we speak with them and how they respond and then we adjust or readapt our our different languages or how you did with uh, your son you wanted yeah. to introduce <laughs> portuguese at some point um, oh, and yes and we don't raise them as, as mirrors of, of ourselves no. that we, we have to remem remember that that children are individuals in their own right with their own uh, yeah. yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, I think um, just just one other. I think in terms of children choosing, um, and children when they choose, they actually know what they're doing. I mean, um, we had I had this other situation where a um, um, actually it was the same boy, the, the 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 one who brought the camel and the Arab figurine as an example of his English. Um, I remember his mum was very surprised when I interviewed the mum that um, he hadn't actually told any of his friends in the French school that he was that he that he spoke Spanish because he had a Spanish dad. Didn't tell it. No, Spanish Spanish mum, French dad didn't tell anyone in the school. So when she went to pick him up one day, the parents were surprised or his and his friends were surprised. Oh, you have a Spanish mum. You didn't say anything. And he, he basically turns around and says, but why would I? It's a kind of, but I'm in a French context, French school. I can speak French. Everything's French. I can function. Why am I going to bring Spanish into it? So sometimes children have yeah. this choice. So in this particular case, this child was foregrounding his French identity. I'm in France. I'm absolutely fine being French in this particular yes. context. I don't need to be anything else. Yes. And uh, I, this reminds me of uh, discussions that we have about third culture kids as well. So when they, when you move to a new place and you, you, it's not really hiding. We adults, we might interpret this as hiding part of your uh, heritage languages or cultures, but actually it is for them maybe more wanting to belong to the others and not seem different from all the rest of their friends. So everyone is speaking French. So, okay, yes, we speak also Spanish at home, but uh, what is important in that particular setting, and you were mentioning this place that might be at that moment or the people that uh, this uh, child was with, uh, were the determining factor to prefer being the French person, being recognized as the French speaker. And like you said before, it can shift and it shifts not only uh, within these three, uh, the, the, the place, person and experience, mm -hmm. but also across time, right? And yes, it changed constantly. I, I know it yeah. from my experience, but uh, <laughs> and, and sometimes children, children are just pragmatic because like you said now that yes. that yes this is a french school so i speak french so what, what do you mean why should i bring spanish into it because it doesn't it, it doesn't belong here it, it's not they're just like when they when um, parents are unhappy when the child is not answering in the right mm. language whatever that is <clears throat> um that is 
interested than being pragmatic. So yeah, this is this, this is what I can do. This is what you understand. Why should I speak anything else? It's nothing against the language. It's just makes sense to them. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I think sometimes children are also trying to work out this multilingual identity and we forget that it's a process. So that, you know, developing this multilingual identity, it doesn't just happen just simply because you were born into three languages. It's a process. And sometimes I think, for example, the example of my son, I think he was just trying to work out, OK, what is all this, all these languages? Um, he was fine with them. He wasn't he wasn't anti English when I was speaking to him in English. He just didn't use the English language. But um you know, and then eventually, it, eventually, he became quite comfortable with it. He's very comfortable with it right now. And children actually develop into um, adults. I mean, teenage the, the teenage years may become complicated again because once again, it is an important time for children to belong. For teenagers, they have to belong to the group. Um, but um, it doesn't necessarily mean that they don't eventually grow into multilingual adults. So I think. Children will experience um, the, um, um, they will perhaps hear comments um, that are not necessarily positive about this being multilingual. Sometimes they're not negative comments, they're just comments of people who don't understand uh, what being multilingual is. Um, and th um, they may, as you say, hide that identity or just maybe not hide it, but just, well, mm. this isn't relevant here, so I'm not going to use it here. But I think what we need to also understand is that children do have, and from a very young age, they know, they learn how to do that. They learn how to foreground a particular identity in a particular context with a particular person from a very young age. And they I know, that, you know, yeah, go on. Yeah, I think that schools also have a very important uh, part to play here because if a school kind of if it's like monolingual this is the school language everybody speaks this or if we have a teacher who acknowledges and then uh, appreciates everything the independent of language that be speaking more than la one language is a good thing so that will the teachers' attitudes will definitely have an, an impact on how the, how willing the child is to come forward with, with these different language identities, don't you think? Yes, um, I also think that education is still very monolingual, mm -hmm. not in reality, because I think what's happening is that our yeah. classrooms are becoming very multilingual and um, quite diverse in terms of um, the number of children with different languages and different backgrounds. But the education system itself, it's is still quite monolingual. Yep. And we, you know, we, we still expect children, if they don't know, you may have a child who speaks three languages, who is able to move between these three languages and cultures who knows how to manage the situation and yet because he's in a fourth um in a country where he's learning his fourth language and because that's the one language he doesn't know suddenly he's a child who doesn't know language and yet he's capable of speaking three languages this child is already a, 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 a competent multilingual individual who is able to manage and um his three languages and three cultures and yet he's in a position where all of this is completely hidden away and just not recognized and not acknowledged. That has an impact on how the child sees himself, yes. And that has an impact on um, the child's um, sense of self and his identity. Now, when there is um, support at home and when the parents are positive about that, um, the, 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 that multilingual identity and the discussion around, okay, don't worry, you already speak three languages, you know, let's go and talk to the teacher or let's go and see how we can um, solve this situation so that it doesn't become too negative. Um, the child is actually able to step back and look at the whole situation ob um, objectively and not allow that to affect yeah. his um, building of his multilingual identity. But um, it does require the support of adults and also the communication with adults. I don't think we talk enough to our children mm -hmm. about their languages and the language identity. We just think it, is, it just happens organically. We should talk about it with them. Yes, and uh, I would like to come back to this uh, discussion. I know, Rita, you wanted to di direct the, um, the, 
the interview towards what the schools can do. But I would like to stay at home, yeah, because when when we have uh, a certain situation with different languages at home, and there is a question, uh, what can parents who raise their children to speak a rarer language or one that is uh, less spoken or less uh, um, represented in the community, ensure that children take pride in the language and identity with it. So this is actually what parents can do if, for example, one of their languages is maybe not taught at school, for example, or is not recognized as a prestigious or um, as important language as the others in the community, how can they help their children with that? Mm -hmm. This is not an easy one, because when, the, um, when one particular language is a, the minority language, meaning you know, it's not spoken so much in that particular community. It is the language that suffers more. Um, and it is the language that the child sometimes asks himself or herself, why do I need this? I think we need to remember that language is about communication. We learn a language because we need to communicate. Um, children become tr multilingual because maybe they have a French dad, an English mom, um, um, they're living in, um, in Italy, so they need all those languages. So they actually feel that they need all those languages. So one of the things that really does help is how do we communicate to the child that they need that language and and and, and it's not undermine the intelligence of children they are not they, they are very said really it's like you know with my son in english i was trying to speak english to him but he says really i know you speak portuguese so what's the point of my you know going to all this trouble of speaking you know bothering to speak this language when i know you speak portuguese so children are quite intelligent yeah. um the one thing i did actually with this is just a personal thing with my son was actually just talk to him and say look this is my language english is really important to me i really like my language so if you don't mind i'll keep speaking it and he was like yeah whatever so um so sometimes you need to have this conversation with children and also you know show children this is my identity and you know yeah. this is important to me um, another thing I would recommend, if it is at all possible, I know sometimes it's very difficult to find literature, picture books in the different languages. And there are now, um, um, you know, especially when you talk about w w with younger children, mm -hmm. um, where you could actually um, use, um, you know, just read to them in that language without necessarily, you know, with pictures. Pictures help help understanding they support understanding so um that could be one way of of doing it um um also songs chants from that particular culture is it possible is there something on the internet that um you can use at home and then it becomes the other thing that um is important is how normal is this language in the home I mean, is it something that happens in the home or is it something that you're bringing in? Oh, dear, go and speak that language because otherwise, you know, you're going to forget it. That, 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 that's not normal communication. That's like a uh, like homework kind of thing. So how can we integrate it into the normal life of a family? Um, so it's not something that just comes in from the outside and then leaves again yes. suddenly. Yes, so that it's a uh, it's it's a language that is uh, valid valued and uh, fostered in a in a very natural way at home as well. And I wanted to say add something because you you mentioned the picture books and the songs for younger children. It's also finding some uh, some songs for teenagers, for example, in the heritage language that is then maybe for teenagers more appealing, and these kind of raps. And so we're we're very. Uh, yeah, very nice for my children to, yeah. to let them have this approach to the culture that, well, is far away from where we are living now. But I would like to uh, redirect now uh, to what actually schools can do or how can education create a space where languages are maintained and identities of multilinguals are shaped in a healthy and in a harmonious way? Um, yeah, as I mentioned, I think um, education is still quite monolingual. Um, mm -hmm. Things are changing slowly, but um, and uh, teacher education needs to um, catch up with um, the multilingual turn, as as we call it. Um, and 
because very often we place teachers in situations where they but I, I don't know how to do this i've got like all these children who speak all these languages what am i supposed to do i speak one language i'm not going to bother with the others and without um, training and um, um, education in the area of multilingualism in the area of integrating plurilingual practices it is very difficult for teachers to do it however we can at least um, recognize and make visible the multilingualism that exists in a school context, that multilingualism that exists in a class context. So you're actually creating, once again, we're back to identity. We are creating a multilingual identity in your classroom. So um, it could be um, a wall with welcome in um, all the different languages that the children speak in the school and the interesting thing is as soon as you start um, eliciting and asking the children to tell you about their languages it's amazing how many languages they find that they you know they want to tell you oh, i know this language and i know that language and i can speak this language or i know one word in that language and they get very excited about mm -hmm. showing um their teacher and their classmates all the languages they know so and i'm using the languages no i'm not using the languages they speak those are two very different things because if, when you speak and you read a language you're talking about proficiency in a language knowing a language is having that connection with a language and it could be through sometimes children learn languages through the internet um you know especially when they're teens and when they're trying to access um yes songs and the latest um the latest um um songs and, and 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 groups so um there are those uh, simple activities where just simply valorizing showing that languages are valued that your cultures are valued that can come into the classroom and that is the first step so no one is asking a teacher of english to teach all the languages that are in that particular class. We're not going to teach Arabic and Turkish and Polish and um, because that's not my job. Uh, however, we can communicate to the children that we actually value this identity that they have with all these amazing languages. And um, we, uh, we can bring these languages into the classroom, make them visible, make drawings, you know, something to make the children feel that they are welcome. The, the whole of them is welcome because sometimes children need to hide the other parts, the other languages, there's other identities because they can feel, even if they're not told, no, we don't want to hear your language here, they feel that it's not welcome. So they close up. And so I think education, there are, there are, um, we have more and more um, teacher education programs that are looking into that and that are bringing multilingual pedagogies into um, the programs and teaching to teachers how to go about even just valuing children's languages. But it's not mainstream. It's not what teachers go and um, do in a teacher education program. And it depends on the countries. It depends on sometimes the simple individuals, those individuals who, OK, I'm going to do multilingualism with you. So um, that's a very important um, question. How? Because that, that question, um, what the school does in terms of multilingualism, either mirrors what's happening in the home or just completely blocks it it just yeah. closes the door on it yeah. and then you have the children having to manage that that that, that 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 situation okay now i have to be or show that i can be french because i'm in a french context i'm in french school for example and perhaps i'm not 100 percent perfect in my speaking of french yet or perhaps i have an accent because all of those elements identify you as a particular person you know the accent uh, your pronunciation the way you use language the words you may choose to use um so you are either positioned as someone who knows or someone who doesn't or someone who belongs or someone who doesn't yeah. belong and the child is having to um manage this and try to how do i position myself so i don't lose my friends so i make friends in this new context so even though my french isn't 100 perfect um 
or maybe through something else. Okay, I'm a good, I play football. I'm really good at football. Let's forget the language, but and let's go and play football. And I make friends in that way. So it's that positioning. But I think, um, yes, education still has a long way to go, I think, in terms of um, multilingualism. Yes, absolutely. And I was also thinking of uh, those children who are schooled in an additional language and who are speaking their languages that they speak at home, but maybe don't read and write it. And then there might be some activities at school that they feel, again, not adequate because they cannot follow, they cannot read uh, them as well as they should at that age level or that uh, um, in that class. So there is again then this um, feeling not belonging, even not to the group of same speaking children at school who might be able to read and write better than them, maybe because they have lived in that country, but your child hadn't. They can make, you know, these, uh, they, they understand more about the culture because they have lived there. And this leads me to another question, if you if you uh, allow me, is this how, yeah, Rita, you wanted to ask something. No, I just wanted to actually have a small ad break because you spoke about uh, how, how uh, children, or how, how schools should be more positive towards multilingual children. Mm -hmm. So so I'm, I'm doing an ad break for the Peach Project who has just released uh, a, free, a free guide for teachers how to support multilingual children. And I, I'm putting the, the link in the comments and that is the end of the ad break. <laughs> <laughs> no, we need, we need lots of these um, resources and ideas and support it, there's a lot of, of um, you mentioned some great ideas on how to make the, the classrooms welcoming. We have more activities and similar things in in to, in that the guide, lots of different activities for different ages. Yeah, no, great. Yeah. yeah. So uh, coming back to my, to my <laughs> next question, that was uh, how does uh, multilingual impact the sense of belonging, being multilingual impact the sense of belonging, especially when we do not have full knowledge of the place and cultures? And I, I think a little bit about myself. I'm the second generation of German living abroad and I'm transmitting a language and culture of um, a culture that I never experienced firsthand. So it's like second or third hand culture that I'm transmitting and it feels a bit strange sometimes. Um, yes, what would you would you suggest? Okay, I think um, first we need to acknowledge and just accept that a multilingual identity is not being German, it's not being Dutch, it's not being French and being, you know, whatever that means, whatever being French means, whatever being Dutch means, it's not about that. You can't um, do that. You can't become a pro, a a fully. I mean, it's it's a difficult it's a difficult discussion to have because mm -hmm. you have to question what being um, um, a fully functioning uh, Dutch person is. So when you when you're a multilingual child and you're getting in you you you, you you're getting um you're receiving information about the different cultures and different languages from different people different places you're not in that particular country you can you, you this this multilingual identity then is about bringing it all together and is about admitting that you just don't know everything I mean, I have, I was, I, I, I transmitted English to my son because that's the language that, that became my first language because I was born in South Africa. But my, my Portuguese is actually technically my mother tongue. Um, yet I, it, I just basically allowed grandparents to do that bit. Um, <laughs> Because I could, but but it's it's and I know when I go to Portugal, I know that um, even though I can function quite well, I have Portuguese um, because I mean I started that's the language I've always spoken to my parents. I know that there are certain certain uh, the pronunciation of certain words um, when I, I I can feel sometimes you know English expressions like slipping into my Portuguese I, and I can see people looking at me and say but no oh, she's not quite or is she isn't she what's going on here and you're always in this position so mm -hmm. it's you know we need to um, acknowledge that 
it's very difficult for individuals that are actually living in these countries when they're looking out at you says oh yeah she's the person who actually doesn't quite belong here but does and uh, but your 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 you know your portuguese isn't quite perfect well no it isn't i don't function in portuguese every day it's impossible for my portuguese to be perfect you see yes. and i think we need to we need to acknowledge that and perhaps you know and children need to understand that it's okay to be just a little bit off and not quite fully <laughs> yes, I think that that's the point. Um, I mean, I as an adult, or when I was in my twenties, I started realizing that that I didn't have to to follow what others were saying. That they were saying, "You're not really German. You're not really Italian. You're not really Swiss." And then you say, "Okay, I'm nothing at all." Yeah, this is the equation that sometimes you make when you are a teenager, when you are trying to belong to different groups, and it's like every every door is shutting, is uh, closing. But instead of saying I'm I'm not only but also, so I'm a yeah. little bit of that, a little bit of that, and in the end, what helped me was also to say, okay, I I know a, a little slice of the big cake that is German, and I know another kind of yes slice of a cake that is Italian, but in the end, not even an Italian. Italian uh, person who lived all the life in Italy and has all the family in Italy is really that perfect Italian because it just doesn't exist. So, but uh, telling that to children and um, my my parents were telling it to me, but I had to experience this firsthand. Mm. This uh, process of uh, of maybe finding this kind of uh, multiple identity, not multiple identity, but multifaceted identity that I have. And I think it's a process, like you said at the beginning, where uh, young children go through when they start going to school and see the other children speak something else and also at home other languages. And then you have different phases, right, during the life. You were mentioning when they are around 11, 12 years old, you observe that in your studies, and then there are the teenagers. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't know, you didn't um, ask also adults, right? So how they are multilingual adults who grew up with multiple languages, if there are also these kind of faces. I can say from my own experience, there are many of these faces. <laughs> oh, yes. One or two. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I did interview the parents and some of the parents mm -hmm. were also multilingual already. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's the interesting thing because um, uh, when children see other children like themselves so it's all about representation very often isn't it i mean we talk about representation so um if a child sees other children like himself oh okay so that child also speaks the, all these languages i'm not the only one then that child feels oh, okay so i'm not the only one so i'm i'm fine i can fit into this group of children because we are the same so they've got that peer um group that um so they can fit in and they don't feel left out and that's why it's so important for schools to be highlighting this multilingualism because then the child can see himself or herself in this context as a multilingual and be comfortable with it because there are other children like this child so but what we have very often in schools is all these multilingual children pretending to be monolinguals exactly and that's not your identity, you know, and sometimes, you know, not all children are in the same situation as this example I gave, the Spanish, French and, and English speaking boy who um, can function in French school without even anybody knowing his Spanish. Not all children are in that situation because some children have a little accent. We adults have accents when we speak our mother tongues. I mean, I have an accent when I speak yes. Portuguese and people can notice that. But um, if we are in a situation that is multilingual, then let's be multilingual so that the children can feel comfortable and they don't go through all these there is a process of going through an identity crisis yeah. um questioning who we are do i really want to be this but the one thing i found about these children and these children um i chose these children because i found them really comfortable with their multilingualism um they had um they not all of them some of them had multilingual um parents but they had they also had very negative multiling um, um, experiences with um, their multilingualism, but they were resilient. They were very strong multilinguals in that they were able to hold on to their languages despite all the negativity around them. 
they had support from the families um, um, and they felt very proud. A lot of what they were saying, towards, especially towards the end, I'm really proud that I've got all the languages. I really love my languages. And one boy said, if you were to take one of these languages, it would be, it would be like taking a part of your body. Yeah. Yeah. It was actually physical. That's how he yeah. felt. You can't take that away from me. Yeah. Um, so, so even though the children are going through sometimes hard times with their multilingualism, it's still really important to them. And even though they're hiding it, it's still really part of them, really important to them. So we need to bring it out and we need to make it visible. Yes. And I think uh, what you just said is also, yeah, going through the phases and they might be hiding it or they might have a reaction like, not responding in the target language for a certain amount of time, mm -hmm. which I also did, and I know we talked about this in other sessions. Yeah. But uh, I think the role of the parents in this is is fundamental. So if you if you keep on um, speaking the language and transmitting all the values and all the the nice things about your culture, and you transmit this pride to to be uh, Japanese or Chinese and mm. to speak the language and to be able to, to, to write it maybe if, you, if mm -hmm. you have the chance to, to learn it, then the child has like this uh, solid base upon which to, to build on. Mm -hmm. So even if something from outside comes in and, and rattles everything and it might uh, tumble down, it won't happen. Yeah. That's a great. Mm -hmm. Can I yeah. just say something? Because you mentioned something really important. You mean maybe they can or cannot write the language. Mm -hmm. I think that any kind of literacy experience that we can give the children is or is positive. Um, even if it's just reading a book in that particular language, they don't necessarily need to learn or you know be writing the language. Mm -hmm. But literacy opens loads of doors into a particular culture. It's much more than just being able to speak um, a language. It's really understanding the culture a lot more than, you know, when it's just remains at an oral level. And the one thing I found with the children that I worked with is because they could, they, they, were, they, they could all read and write to a certain, to, to different degrees, their different languages. And they were very, they were, they, that sort of cemented that identity, it was, it was kind of the cement mm -hmm. that, um, cre that, 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 that um, made that identity concrete. Okay, yeah. this is who I am. I can read these languages. And through the literacy, the children had access to a completely different culture. They understood the culture. Um, and then the literacy also allowed the children to understand, especially when they're minority cultures mm -hmm. you know you're the only like speaker of this particular culture or this particular language and yet you speak a language that has a history like hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years of history that invented writing for example mm -hmm. that uh, you know and yet you don't know that because you don't have access to that culture and you think oh no my culture you know I'm going to hide it because I'm so embarrassed of being an Arabic speaker but look mm -hmm. at the history look at the literacy that Arabic can give you so if you can give children a little bit a little the sort of inroads into the literacy of that particular culture it really makes a big difference Yes, absolutely. It, it reminds me of the metaphor of planting seeds, right? Mm. You, you plant little seeds and then you, uh, at some point, they, they will grow. And uh, I, I would like also to, to point out, because um, I just happened to, to speak with families where the children uh, are struggling with reading and they were wondering how to go ahead with all their languages if the child barely reads in one of the three or four languages that he has. And uh, we were talking about audiobooks, and he's very, very fond and fascinated about the, the huge uh, amount of books that he can listen to because he's very uh, auditively oriented. So he, he picks everything up. And something that he said at some point to his mom, which I would like to share today, was, mm -hmm. I now feel my language. I now feel the language. And she was so excited and she wants to share it and I said this is something that is actually has to do with identity as well so the moment that this child was able to feel the language not only experiences and, and trying to he was trying so hard to to speak it and and then also to read it which didn't didn't work out well uh, but this feeling was amazing I think it's one one great step forward for these children yeah yes we, we have one question from yes. um Stephen Williams, 
Can one be multilingual with monolingual parents? I mean, by adulthood? Yes, you can. Uh, a person is using two or more languages in many contexts. Is that person plurilinguistic, plurilingual or multilingual? Yes, you can become, I think, right? Yes, yes. I mean, I, I have monolingual parents um, and um, even though they lived in South Africa, Portuguese was very much the uh, language at home and um, we have and, and, and I speak multiple languages simply because of the context I was being brought up in and my son, then my son then was in exactly the same situation, but he already had multilingualism in the home and multilingual parents so um yes you can become multilingual and i think a lot of people most people are multilingual the question is how do you actually define multilingualism and how do you what do you understand by multilingualism and we are once again confronted by this monolingual um um biases in that for example if you don't speak a language perfectly then you then you can't be considered a multilingual um there are you know the the i i i you know some people learn loads of languages but you only ever really need two or three maybe four in a particular context so the the other languages that you may have learned or picked up along the way and are just sort of dormant um they're still part of your language repertoire they're still there and I actually just when just one very quick example is that I I mean being born in South Africa we learned Afrikaans and now I'm living in Norway now Afrikaans has just not been part of you know born in South Africa speak Afrikaans left South Africa then Afrikaans sort of just disappeared I don't need it I don't need to speak it in Portugal in France then I came to Norway and suddenly Afrikaans is making is making a comeback because there are so many words in Norwegian that I'm connecting to Afrikaans that are the same as Afrikaans. I think, oh my God, now I need my Afrikaans to learn Norwegian. And I haven't needed Afrikaans for the last 25 years. So those languages are important. They may actually one day come in handy. So it, so once again, how do we define ourselves as a multilingual individual? And um, very often we don't. We don't, even though we may know four, five languages, but because we don't know those languages perfectly, that word perfectly, um, we don't consider ourselves to be multilingual. I'm, and I'm not defining multilingualism from a research perspective or a theoretical perspective. I'm defining multilingualism from a, 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 a um, communicative perspective. How many languages can I function in, mm -hmm. basically? You know, so... Um, so, so that's also an identity. I mean, do you identify as a multilingual individual or as a speaker of one language and you know all the other languages um, just to various, various, various degrees? So I, I think that's important. And I, with the children, working with these children is wonderful because they already identify themselves um, okay. as multilingual. Mm -hmm. And they were able to do that but i think adults sometimes have a harder it's harder for adults um than it is for children in certain in certain respects yes but they sometimes uh, when you then ask them how many languages do you understand and how many do you speak uh, they can come up with two or three and then they are surprised to say, oh, well, I understand two, three languages and I'm, I'm multilingual. I say, yes, wow. <laughs> and then, no, mm. even if you're not only receptive to some extent, I mean, it's it's a continuum, right, from yeah, the, the understanding several words and being able to follow a discussion and then being able also to speak up to being able to, to, to read and write. Um, okay, yes. Is there any other question, Rita and uh, Tetsu? No, uh, I think, uh, it, again, the time has flew right by. And uh, I do see Stephen Williams has a, a little follow-up comment. We'll, I think we'll wrap up with this. Uh, he says, I speak my mother tongue perfectly, but do not speak the standard variety perfectly. <laughs> I think many of us uh, can, yeah. uh, can, can identify mm -hmm. with and that. Yes, and we can close with the perfection. There is no such thing. There as you go. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I think we have to define what perfectly means. Yes. But yes. definitely, I mean, my thoughts on, on today's session is, is really that you know, I, I feel touched. It, it, it felt like Nair was speaking to me <laughs> the whole time, both as a, a 
a kid who grew up multilingual and who's gone through the phases where you know I was proud of certain languages and and ashamed kind of uh, of, of certain languages where I didn't want to speak it. Uh, but now as a parent raising my kids in different languages and and you know thinking of various ways to communicate, uh, as you mentioned, you know that. The, the, the goodness of every language that we're trying to teach our kids and finding a way to to really circumvent the situation where they feel shame or mm. or associate shame with with any of the languages and so far knock on wood you now they're, they're doing all the languages that we're, we're trying to raise them in so mm. no refusal at the current time and uh, i feel pretty proud of that <laughs> well done yes well done but i i think um it would be nice that the parents, or it would be good if the parents uh, listen to their children and find mm -hmm. out why they are refusing or not feeling very comfortable in or with the language. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes it, it can be someone saying something strange about the way they speak or even something more. So not thinking that it, it's going to go over and in a few days or in a few weeks, months, years, it will be over. Uh, but to really address this and to, to talk about this, of course, if the child is ready and the parents mm -hmm. know exactly how to convey then this pride and the value of the language again. Yes. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, I always tell uh, folks that in multilingual parenting, the parenting is so much more yeah. you know, heavy, I guess, and <laughs> yeah. waiting uh, than the, the ling language knowledge or whatever that you have. It's, it's yeah. really about communicating with your child. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I do this very simple but traditional kind of very hands-on uh, uh, method where I simply sit down with my kid uh, every, every two weeks where I take the time, schedule that time to have a heart-to-heart -heart discussion. I mean, not just about languages and that, but just overall taking that time to sit down with with them and hearing them out. So uh, not not a very fancy thing to do, I guess. But but we're so busy. I, I just find that we need to take that time, mm -hmm. schedule time, that time for them, uh, and it's also for me. So it's kind of something I I do. I don't know if that could. Oh, please, please don't, uh, please don't talk that down. Uh, so you're, say, you're saying mm -hmm. something so utterly important that mm -hmm. we take time, and you, Nay, you mentioned that too, mm -hmm. that we should mm -hmm. speak to our children even earlier than we think that they yeah. understand. They will that, understand right. when you when that's you right. speak about how how you love your language, what it means to you, how it felt when you grew up, mm -hmm. and and how you speak it with with certain people, and 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 kind of. Just share your, be open, share your feelings. Yeah. We, we, we should never fall in the trap of thinking that they're not mature enough to, to understand. Yeah. Um, I, I really take, you know, what they say importantly mm. because it's their perception, it's their truth. And that's, that's, that's everything. <laughs> yes. And we have to provide the, the infrastructure to support them in their way of seeing the world. So. That, that's a wrap for us. I don't know if, if Nair, you have any last message for our audience, any words of encouragement? Uh, Just um, to hang in there, carry on and mm -hmm. be multilingual, carry on and be, you know, develop that multilingual identity. It's a wonderful, colorful world when that's you right. actually live between languages. Uh, and um, the one thing that I think is really important is how the children not only manage their identity, but when they make jokes across languages and when they're <laughs> able to use their languages and um, laugh about them. And that's just brilliant. So, um, you know, be, 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 carry on with your multilinguals, with your multilingualism and um, support children's multilingual identities. Very important. Hey, man, to that. Yeah, thank you, very much. Thank you so much. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much. So <laughs> let's see here. Let me put up our, our screen for the next session. Yes. Yes. On Tuesday, 5th of October, we will have Professor Dr. Larissa Aronin, Associate Professor at the Oranian Academy College of Education in Israel, as our guest, who will talk about how to see feel and connect our languages. 
So please join us on Tuesday, the 5th October at 1 p.m. New York, 6 p.m. London and 7 p.m. Paris. And I think uh, Larissa, uh, Larissa and uh, Nair know each other, right? Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's going to be a nice uh, transition. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Well, that, Thank you. that's great. Thank you so much, uh, Nair. Thank you to everybody Thank who's you. tuned in on Facebook and on YouTube. Thank you for your uh, questions and discussion. I hope you enjoyed this session. Now, if you could give us a little feedback, you could see it in the, the, the link is in the description. That would be great so that we could bring uh, improvements to our sessions for you. Any last words? I don't know if we can get any better than this. <laughs> oh, we raise the bar every time. We're choking ourselves. <laughs> There's always room for improvement. Thank you very much, Nair, for Thank being you. our guest and for your very encouraging words about uh, supporting our children's identity and all the languages and to be proud of everything that we are doing. Thank you very much. And so I wish everyone a nice uh, evening, morning, wherever you are. Good night. Also, Tetsu, who is <laughs> somewhere where he's in the middle of the I'm night. in the middle. Uh, oh, in the dear. middle of the day. You're the other way. Um, yeah. See you on the 5th of October. Okay. Bye. Auf Wiedersehen. Tschüss. All right. Bye-bye, <laughs> okay. everybody. Thank you. Bye. 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 B